Hey everyone, and thanks for joining us this afternoon um, for the migration uh, seminar of uh, of March of April. It's already early April. So my name is Lara Piton. Uh, I'm a postdoctoral researcher at UNU Merit, uh, and I'm convening this seminar series uh, on behalf of UNU Merit, uh, Maastricht University, and Metsabite in the Netherlands. The migration seminar series invites researchers, practitioners, and policymakers uh, to discuss their work that relates to migration in some capacity. Um, and before I'll introduce today's speaker to you, um, there's a quick housekeeping that I need to do. So our speaker's talk today will last for approximately 30 to 40 minutes, after which we'll have time for discussion and questions from the audience. So I'd like to ask you to keep your questions until after our speaker is done with their presentation. So you can either put your questions then in the chat um, or raise your hand using the raise your hand function uh, and then ask the question yourself. If you prefer to put the question in the chat, then I'll make sure to read it out loud um, for you. So please, in the meantime, uh, keep your microphones muted. Your camera can be turned on, of course, if you like. Uh, but as I said, be aware that we're recording this seminar for distribution on a YouTube channel later on. So on our YouTube channel, you can also find recordings of previous migration seminars uh, in the past. But now let me introduce um, our speaker to you. I'm really happy uh, to welcome Martijn Hendricks today, um, who is a senior researcher at the Erasmus Happiness Economics Research Organization, and is also an assistant professor of happiness economics um, at the Department of Applied Economics uh, of the Erasmus University in Rotterdam. So his research focuses broadly on the causes and consequences of happiness, um, particularly in relation to migration work uh, and economic behavior. Martijn and I just had a brief chat about current work that he's doing on happiness uh, in, um, let's say, the surroundings of, of uh, reception centers uh, in Germany, which I think is super interesting and super promising. So watch the space. Um, but today um, he'll uh, talk to us about a soon to be published or maybe even published by now a study in International Migration Review. Uh, and it details American immigrants' experience and obstacles in their daily sociocultural integration in Germany by particularly examining the uh, impact of daily integration behavior on momentary happiness, which is a term that is not known to me. Um, so I'm really looking forward, Martijn, to uh, having you elaborate uh, on all of this uh, here now. Thanks so much again for being here, um, and the floor is all yours. Thank you for having me, and thank you all for taking the time to learn more about my research. I'm going to share my screen. I'm also looking forward to discuss this topic with you and hear your insights. Um, so yeah, Laura already mentioned the long title of this article and I will explain what momentary happiness is. Um, this is uh, co-authored by Randall Bernberg and this article, so yeah, it's forthcoming in the International Migration Review. It's really inspired by uh, our own personal lives. So Randall is a American uh, immigrant in Germany. And he has seen the struggles of uh, other immigrants around him in Germany to integrate into the German society. And from my personal experience, so my wife is Mexican. So she lives in the Netherlands for 10 years now, but I've also seen her through these 10 years struggle to uh, integrate into the, into the Dutch society. So that really inspired us for this paper. Yeah. Okay, so the background of the paper. So is that these Im uh, that immigrants, Many of them struggle to culturally and socially integrate. So our personal stories are not exceptions. Many immigrants face this. And this is kind of strange because the literature has shown over and over that sociocultural integration has long-term benefits. It has long-term benefits in terms of well-being, in terms of labor market performance, in terms of educational achievement. So in that sense, integration for immigrants will have positive results in the long term. Um, so that's, then the question is really interesting. Why do they face so many struggles to integrate? Um, second, when we look at the natives, natives often also want the immigrants to integrate. And actually there are often tensions in host societies 
by the lack of integration of the immigrants. So also from a native perspective, um, uh, they would be motivated to reduce the struggles of immigrants. I zoom in on in this paper on the momentary consequences of integration behaviors. And momentary means in the moment, so right now. So if I would show some kind of integration behavior, and in this paper, we will focus on two of these integration behaviors. One is uh, speaking the language of the host country. So for an American expat in Germany, this would be speaking German. And the second one is um, uh, interethnic contact. So for an American immigrant in Germany, this means interacting with Germans. So the question of this paper is, what are the consequences in terms of how happy you feel at that moment of showing these uh, integration behaviors? Yeah. And this will help us better understand, well, first of all, these short-term consequences of integration behaviors. It also helps us identify these obstacles that immigrants might face in the daily socio-cultural integration process. And eventually it can help us explain why some immigrants might do very well in terms of integration, but others um, show a lack of integration behaviors or actually uh, might show segregation behaviors. And our thesis is that these daily integration behaviors that I just mentioned, so the interactions with majority group members and speaking the majority language, that this negatively affects the happiness of immigrants at that moment during that specific behavior um, in the early stages of integration. So we hypothesize that it's not any more a negative effect when immigrants are already well integrated, but that especially when they're not so not well integrated yet, that then they experience these costs, these momentary costs of showing these integration behaviors. And I will explain why. Um, and that this might uh, ultimately discourage them from engaging in these integration behaviors. Okay, then we will move to some uh, like the theoretical framework. And the first hypothesis, it's quite a long hypothesis, but it consists of a main effect and a moderation effect. So if I first focus on the main effect, our hypothesis is that immigrants will feel happier when interacting in their mother tongue than in the host country's majority language. And the moderation effect here is that this is especially the case for those who are less fluent in the majority language. And I will explain why we hypothesize this. Well, when you uh, interact in the host country's majority language, instead of your mother tongue, the effect balance, so effect uh, means that your emotional balance might be negative because interacting in a different language might increase uh, nervousness. You might be nervous to communicate in that language fear or fear of making mistakes, uh, embarrassment when you don't find the right words or um, make uh, a grammar mistake, and frustration. Uh, so if you, for example, don't find the right words. Of course, also speaking in a majority in a, well, your second language can also give you a sense of pride and enjoyment, which are positive emotions that raise happiness. Um, but um, what has been shown so far is that these negative emotions, that they are stronger than the positive emotions. So that at balance, uh, it's, uh, it reduces happiness. Second, when you engage in speaking a second language, this is a fatiguing endeavor. So for example, in my case, when I need to speak 
uh, Spanish with my family-in-law, then for one hour it goes well, but afterwards I'm exhausted. Uh, so that is something immigrants encounter when speaking in a second language. Um, third, you might have the issue of uh, less ability to comprehend what other people are saying. So what, for example, Germans are saying when you are an American immigrant, um, when you speak German. And also it's harder to express yourself um, when German is not your native language, but you are interacting in German. And that um, this can lead to, for example, tensions between uh, when you speak in a certain language with your partner or a friend that's not your mother tongue. It's harder to express your emotions and it, this can lead uh, to people understanding each other less. So, and that can decrease happiness in a moment. And then the fourth mechanism is that when you um, speak a language non-fluently or with an accent, it can lead to prejudice uh, or you can be treated as an outsider or even discriminated uh, right in that moment because of how you speak the language. So these are four mechanisms that support our main effect that we hypothesized. But then we have the moderation effect. And what we argue is that these four mechanisms, that they diminish with better language proficiency. So when you're better at speaking German in this case, as an American immigrant, um, you will experience probably less uh, embarrassment about not speaking the language so well, uh, less fear of speaking the language, etc. It becomes less fatiguing when you know a language better. Um, you have a better ability to compre comprehend others and you have more ability to express yourself and you are more of an insider um, when you speak the language more fluently. Yeah, then we move to the second hypothesis. And so also the second integration behavior that we focus on in this paper. And that is that immigrants will feel happier when interacting with people from their heritage society than with people from the host society. And this applies particularly to those who are less uh, culturally integrated. And here we also have three, or well, actually we start with one advantage of, of interacting with people from the host society. So when an American, say, interacts with a German, um, it can actually have a positive effect because it can improve mutual understanding and it can break down barriers between these people. And this can actually be a really nice experience for the immigrant when, for example, these barriers with a German person are broken down. But we expect that the two mechanisms below, that these are stronger. And the first one is that interethnic exchange is complicated by language boundaries, uh, cultural boundaries, and attitudinal boundaries. So for example, when it's hard to interact with each other because you don't speak the same language, yeah, then the interaction becomes less pleasant. Um, when there are larger cultural boundaries, people might understand each other less well. Um, and this can negatively uh, affect your happiness during that uh, interaction. You have attitudinal boundaries, so it can be less pleasant to interact with people who are less open to, uh, say, people from other cultures. Then the other mechanism is that people tend to feel closer and more comfortable around people with the same, uh, with similar heritage. 
Um, yeah, this is from general psychological research that shows that the more similar uh, a person is, the more the happier people are to interact with such a uh, person. And in general, immigrants tend to be a bit less less similar to a native. Um, yeah, so on average. But also these above neg uh, negative mechanisms, they do diminish with better cultural integration. So for example, these cultural boundaries, they become smaller when the immigrant is better integrated uh, culturally. Also, uh, when an immigrant is better culturally integrated, um, the immigrant is, feels more similar to the native. So then uh, interaction is easier. And the third hypothesis is that sociocultural integration will be more positively related to enduring happiness than momentary happiness. So these first two hypotheses were about momentary happiness. So how happy you feel right at that moment you show an integration behavior. But hypothesis three makes the contrast between long-term effects of integration and these short-term effects. Okay, so, well, you've already noticed that I'm focusing on US immigrants in Germany. And there is a specific reason for this. Um, and the biggest reason is that we want to disentangle language effects from nationality effects. And US immigrants in Germany is, is a good case for this because these immigrants sometimes interact in English with Germans and sometimes in German. And this allows us to disentangle these language and nationality effects. We wouldn't be able to disentangle these two effects if, um, say, the immigrants always interact in German with Germans. Because then the nationality effect interacting with Germans is the same as the language effect interacting with uh, in German. And we also chose this case because it offers a relatively conservative test of a more generally applicable hypothesis. So this we wanted to take a case study that tests our hypothesis, but that would also uh, show that probably if we would do it in other contexts, we would see at least uh, uh, the same effects or stronger effects. We, we think it is a conservative test because the US immigrants in Germany are perceived relatively favorable compared to other immigrant groups. So the possible negative effects of interacting with Germans might be smaller for these US immigrants than for other types of, uh, some other types of immigrants. And a second reason is that the linguistic distance between German and English is relatively small, especially when you compare it to language languages with uh, different alphabets. Um, so if we see a language effect, then it might be in other contexts, other immigrant groups, even bigger effects. Okay, then we go to some counter arguments that you could make that this is not a conservative test. One is that Germany has a relatively plural uh, or does not have a pluralistic climate. So Germans do expect immigrants to uh, adapt to their culture um, and they're less open to uh, the heritage cultures of, um, of immigrants. Um, if you compare this to other countries. And also Americans are relatively often monolingual, so they might have some more difficulties in learning, um, learning a second language. 
but we expect that the two reasons mentioned above are stronger than the, these two counter arguments. Okay, and the final background before I go to the empirical study is that these US citizens in Germany, they must acquire a German residence permit. So most of the people you will see in our sample, they are expats moving because they are relocated by their employer or because they accepted the job in uh, Germany or for education purposes. Okay, so how did we test our hypothesis? Uh, first, um, the respondents answered a one-time survey. In this one-time survey, they received questions about life satisfaction. Life satisfaction is a measure of happiness. Um, sociocultural integration. I will show you later what specific questions this index uh, comprises and some sociodemographics. Then in step two, they were asked to participate in the day reconstruction method. This means that for seven days, they were asked to complete happiness diaries. So in this diary, they had to divide the day in activities, for example, working, um, working, um, studying, um, commuting, uh, watching a movie, etc. So they divide the day in activities and then for each of these activities, they indicate you know, what specific activity they were doing, where they were at the moment. So that can be, for example, at home or at work or in the car. Uh, who was with them during that activity. Uh, so it can be like a partner, a colleague, uh, a friend, an acquaintance, etc. The nationalities of these interaction partners, uh, if applicable, so if there were interaction partners, if they were not alone. Um, so this can be German or American or another language. The language spoken during that activity, so German, English, or another language, and how happy they were feeling during that activity on a, a zero to 10 scale. So, and that results in our analysis sample. Um, so we had 213 US immigrants in Germany who well completed both this one-time survey and these happiness diaries. Um, and this amounted to, well, close to 900 happiness diaries in more than 6,000 daily activities. Um, with about 60 hours per respondents of these diaries. And the average activity had a duration of uh, about two hours. Um, so again, these activities could be like watching a movie or eating or working. Okay, yeah, so then we have a large data set of all kinds of happiness scores during uh, all these activities and with these interaction partners from different nationalities, etc. And then we estimated the fixed effects model, meaning that we do a within subject analysis. We included individual fixed effects. So we're not comparing between, between people, but we, look at the variation between the activities of one certain person. So we regressed momentary happiness on the nationality of the interaction partner, the language which was spoken during the interaction, and we had a range of control variables. So these controls were the type of activity. Um, so type of activity again, like working, watching a movie, eating, etc. The location, uh, interaction partner, so friend, acquaintance, colleague, etc. Day of the week and the time of the day. Um, 
And here you see how momentary happiness was measured. So how happy were you during this activity? Zero, extremely unhappy to 10, extremely happy. Now we will look at the main effects of hypothesis one and two. So what we see in column one is that momentary happiness is regressed on the nationality of the interaction partners, where German, the German interaction partner is the reference group and an American uh, interaction partner, we see no significant difference between interacting with an American interaction partner or a German interaction partner. Uh, so nationality doesn't matter um, in general. Um, also, when the interaction partners were mixed, so both Americans and Germans, we don't see any effect and other languages also not. So no nationality effects. When we look at column two, we did the same, but then for language. So again, the German speaking German is the reference group. But here we see that speaking English as opposed to German has a happiness a benefit of 0 0.23 on the 0 to 10 happiness scale. And what we also see is a mixed language also benefit. Um, yeah. Then in column three, we try to disentangle these two effects. So we disentangle the nationality effect from the language effect. And well, our main conclusions remain the same. We don't see any effect of nationality, but we do see a clear language effect. Saying that speaking English uh, leads to more happiness at that moment for US immigrants than speaking German. Now we look at the moderation effects. Um, so basically what I did is I added to that, um, to the formula I just showed you, to this formula here, an interaction term between, for example, language and language proficiency. And that's how you can visualize the effects here. I will explain how to interpret this graph. So, on the vertical axis, you see the happiness difference between speaking English and speaking German. On the horizontal axis, you see a person's language proficiency in German. So how well a person can speak uh, German. Those with the lowest language proficiency, so here with uh, the language proficiency of one, they feel more than one point happier when speaking English on the zero to 10 happiness scale. So that's very substantial. But you see that when language proficiency improves, the happiness benefit of speaking English uh, reduces and completely disappears when um, a US immigrant speaks perfectly German. So then there's no happiness advantage anymore of speaking English. So there's a clear moderation effect here. When we look at nationalities, we did something, yeah, we did something similar, but now with cultural integration. And what you see is that there is about a half a point happiness benefit of interacting with Americans when the American immigrant is not well integrated in German society. But when the cultural integration improves, you see that this happiness benefit of interacting with an American reduces over time, or well, reduces, yeah. And eventually also disappears. So when an American immigrant is well integrated in 
German society, there's no benefit anymore of interacting with a German, uh, sorry, with an American person. Well, so language proficiency was measured in this previous slide with this question, how well do you know the German language? And the cultural integration was measured with these three items that are uh, blue shaded. So language proficiency, cultural affinity, and feeling at home in Germany. Then in the next step, we will use the sociocultural integration index. And that has three additional measures that capture more the social side of sociocultural integration. So that is uh, the proportion of time speaking in German, proportion of time with a German interaction partner based on the DRM, the direct instruction method data, and the proportion of friends in Germany who are German. So I didn't use these final three items um, in this second uh, in the second uh, figure, because then there's an overlap between uh, this uh, momentary effect, so the DRM data that are used here, and this index. That's why I focus here on your culture. Okay, so with the social cultural integration index of six items that I just showed you, we tested the, the third hypothesis that there is a um, positive effect of social cultural integration on enduring subjective well-being. That's indeed what we see when we use the uh, life satisfaction measure that I showed you. Um, and life satisfaction is measured as all things considered how satisfied are you with your life as a whole nowadays? We see that people who are better integrated are clearly more satisfied with life. When we look at average momentary happiness, and with average, I mean from the day reconstruction method, when you take the average of all these different happiness, um, moments of happiness, then you also see a clear positive uh, relationship with sociocultural integration. So this shows an, an interesting contradiction that integration behaviors at the moment are negatively related um, to at, at least language use, but in the long term, there's a clear positive relationship. Okay, then we did additional analysis to uh, well, check the robustness of our results and to dive a bit deeper in the results. And the first of all, there was no effect um, of momentary happiness in T minus one, so in the previous activity, on the language that a person used or the nationality of the interaction partners. So if in my previous activity, um, I felt very happy, that doesn't affect the language I use in the next activity or the nationality of the interaction partners. Um, so there's no reverse causality. What we did find is that the proportion of time interacting with Germans is lower when people experience higher momentary costs of doing so. And that is what I mentioned at the beginning at the motive for the study. People or well, immigrants sometimes struggle to integrate. And that might be because of these momentary happiness costs of showing integration behaviors. And that's what we see here that they, when they experience higher costs in the moment of showing these integration behaviors, then in the long term, they simply 
engage less in these behaviors, at least in terms of interacting with Germans. We didn't find that for language. We didn't find that people who had a higher happiness cost of interacting in German, that they also in the long term interacted less in German. So we find partial evidence that higher costs lead to less integration behaviors. Um, then we also looked at what if you use a mix of languages or interact with a mix of nationalities. And there we also see these declining benefits of using these mixed languages and nationalities compared to German uh, with better language proficiency or acculturation. So also this moderation effect is also seen for these mixed languages. Then we also looked at whether this effect of language use, momentary happiness, is only during that particular activity or whether it also translates to negative effects in the next activities. Uh, so for example, if after this seminar you will eat, whether then your happiness during eating is negatively affected by the language that is spoken during the seminar. And there we did not find any effects. So the negative effects of uh, speaking German in this case are short-lived, only during this activity. Um, what we saw with the American immigrants where they were particularly happier speaking English with friends and acquaintances, uh, but not with family members or colleagues. Um, while the nationality effects were not contingent on the interaction partner. I don't have a good explanation why, uh, why this is the case for friends and acquaintances and not family members and colleagues. So that's interesting to see whether this is robust in other uh, research in the future. Um, what we also see is, and that's a reason why better integrated immigrants are happier. And that is that they spend less time on passive leisure. They spend less time at home and less time alone. And these are typically activities um, in which people don't feel so happy. So in terms of their time composition, better integrated immigrants, they spend their time in a happier way. Uh, but also they spend more time with colleagues and at work. Um, then uh, I will go to the final one. So we used a convenience sample, but we also made this convenience sample representative for the US immigrant population in Germany in terms of age, gender, and length of stay. And then we found similar results. So even though we used a convenience sample, if we had used a representative sample, we would have found similar effects. So the conclusions are then that, um, especially immigrants who are not fluent in the host country's dominant language, they feel happier when communicating in their mother tongue. Similarly, interacting with people from the host country affects momentary happiness negatively for less culturally integrated immigrants. So here we don't see a main effect, but we did see a moderation effect. And for especially these less culturally integrated immigrants, they feel happier when interacting with Americans as opposed to Germans. And we've seen that uh, sociocultural integration relates positively to enduring subjective well-being, so in the long term. And then the implications of this study are that sociocultural integration is really an investment for immigrants because it involves short-term costs to happiness, uh, especially in terms of uh, language use and particularly at early stages of integration. And that's why um, you might see that 
um, especially at the early stage of integration, immigrants struggle to show these integration behaviors. And quickly, for example, uh, segregate. And this can help explain the limited or slow integration of uh, well, at least some immigrants. But it can also help explain ethnic segregation and social isolation among immigrants. Um, because, for example, with social isolation, if you need to interact in a different language that um, lowers your happiness by one point on that zero to 10 scale, you are less willing to interact in that language. And in the long term, that might lead to loneliness or social isolation. And it also underscores the importance of safe environments for interethnic contact and second language use, uh, where immigrants, for example, feel less embarrassment or, or less prejudice, less judgment, in which they, in a more safe way, can um, get through those early stages of integration with the least happiness costs possible. And so we focus now really on this one case study, but we argue that these theoretical mechanisms, they should apply across migration contexts. If I go back to these, to these mechanisms, they should apply to all contexts. For example, um, that second language use is a fatiguing endeavor. That's not specific to US immigrants in Germany. That's for any second language. Um, this comprehension argument, um, uh, more difficulty expressing yourself. These are all very general mechanisms. Similar here, these boundaries uh, in terms of language, culture, attitudinal, and the similarity argument, they, they will apply to all uh, in all different immigrant contexts. Oh. Then we also found that this relationship that we saw between enduring subjective well being, so happiness, and integration was very similar to other migrant contexts. So this, these relationships that we see here, they have been studied in other contexts and there they were of similar sizes. So this is not, not an extreme case that we have here with US immigrants in Germany. And as I said at the beginning, it's a relatively conservative test because Americans are regarded relatively positive by Germans and the linguistic distance is relatively small. So thank you for listening to my uh, paper. And then uh, I think uh, the floor is open for the discussion.